a lot of you have been asking for some Python examples. So I thought about how to best cover this. And I concluded that the easiest way to get started is to use an SSH library. While this might be one of the slower options in terms of execution speed, the code for the low level communication between the SSH client and the SSH server, which in our case is the router, is already written by someone else. And all you need to do is essentially copy router OS CLI commands into your Python code. In the future, I might play around with Python and API. But in this video, I will be using an SSH library Paramico to execute some basic commands on my router. We got our main function, so let's create our SSH client. This command will load SSH keys from your operating system. You could use passwords as well. But in my experience, the Paramico SSH client will try to use weak ciphers such as Blowfish by default, and the connection will fail. If you don't know how to use keys instead of a password when you SSH into your router, watch our video on SSH RSA keys, where I show you how to create RSA keys both from RouterOS and from Linux. Don't worry if you are on Windows or Mac, as the same principles will apply. Next, I can connect to my router. With these three commands, we establish a connection to our router. And next, we can start sending some commands. The execute command will send a CLI command and return a tuple of three objects. We are currently interested in SDD out object as it contains the output from our router. As you can see, the command was executed successfully, but the print command added extra new lines. Let's remove them. There, that's prettier. The std in, std out, and std er are all objects with open channels, and it is good practice to close them. And now, if we wanted to execute multiple commands in row, it would look something like this. That creates a lot of mess. It would be much better to create a separate function which takes the XSH client and gives it a command to execute and then returns us the output. Let's try to execute a command in this manner. And it works as expected. But we can improve our execute function a little further. The std error is an output just like the std out that we can read line by line. And I believe it will return every, any errors that have occurred within the SSH protocol. But there is another type of error that can occur. If we send a command that is not accepted by the device, it will most likely return some error message in the STD out. But it will also return a status code telling us whether the command was successful or not. And we can view it uh, in the following way. Okay, so if this code is one, we know that the command failed. And if it was successful, it will be a zero. Another good practice I would like to mention is to actually close the SSH client when you no longer need it. Just add this command. 
Until this close command is sent to the SSH client, it is kept open until it times out. If you're executing commands continuously, you probably want to keep it open, but if you only need it periodically, it's probably better to open and close as needed. Okay, now let's say I want to execute multiple commands. As you can see, I used the interface print command to view my interfaces and then used this little number assigned to it to disable ether1. Now, it is not a good practice to be executing commands in your scripts using these numbers because they're assigned only temporarily. It is essentially a line number. If any of the items on the list change, like you add more interfaces in the middle of the list, all those numbers are going to change as well. So that might break your script. It is much better to use something like the interface name or the internal ID, which I'll show you in a second. Okay, the same data that we got with interface print was returned all bunched up because we used the as value parameter. And among the contents, there is also this dot ID value. This identifier is unique for each item or interface in this case. And if you've ever had configuration using, for example, interface name, and then you deleted or moved that interface you might have seen that the configuration contents got replaced with a star and a number. And that, that was the ID of the item that was then deleted. Let's see if we can make this data more readable. Okay, this created an, ar an array of strings with one, uh, one string for each interface but there's also this empty element because the whole uh, data started with an ID. So we need to remove that. And also at the very end of this data, there were two invisible symbols that in this case have been added to the last interface. I will remove one of them for now. Okay, that is starting to look like some usable data that we can now use to make some sort of further decisions. Okay, that gave us the individual interface names. Before I split uh, the interface into attributes, I removed the last symbol. This is because for most of the interfaces, the last symbol was a semicolon, which would create an empty element if we just did the split semicolon. And on the last interface, instead of a semicolon, we had left an invisible symbol that we removed in this case as well. The router OS CLI actually has a get command as well, which we can use to request specific data for a particular item. And I'm using what's called an F string to pass the interface name inside the string.
Now we got the same data as we got when using the print command, but also we got some Ethernet interface stats along with whether this interface is disabled or not and whether it is running or not. So let's do something further with the disabled and running statuses. Okay, these couple lines should disable an interface if it is not already disabled and it is not already running and it will enable it if it's already disabled. As you can see, we disabled all of the interfaces not running. If I execute it again, all of the interfaces are now enabled. Okay, let's put it in a loop for fun. Let's also add a little delay. And as you can see, it's just looping through the interfaces. What's nice about this code is that it is dynamic, so we can add more interfaces. And as you can see, the newly created interface is now participating in the loop. Obviously, this exact code is not something you would be using in real life situation, but I'm hoping this demonstration gave you the information that you require to start writing your own Python scripts that control your Mikrotik devices. If you have any interesting use case examples, or you are working on some interesting problems, let us know in the comments.